Tandem Nomads, episode 168. Successful working couples are those who develop the habit of having deliberate conversations around how to share the load, support each other's priorities, and to structure their lives in a way that lets both of them thrive in the long term. Hello, Nomad Nation. Welcome to Tandem Nomads, the podcast show and entrepreneurship platform where you can find great inspiration and tips to grow a successful portable business and thrive in your global nomadic life. This is your host, Emel Dregi. I'm a business and marketing coach and the founder of Tandem Nomads. This episode is probably what is at the foundation of why I started Tandem Nomads, which is the dual career challenges of many expats who have to live on the move. And one of them who has a career might most often need to also give up their career to allow this experience to happen for the whole family on the move. So as you know, for those of you who've been listening to this show for a while, I've been giving up my career to be able to move abroad and thought that Starting a business is the solution to do a career challenges. And I still think of that. And this is why I teach global nomads how to build a portable business. However, I do think that it is important when we move and we decide to have this move to, to sit down together as a couple, to have a clear conversation of what we want out of this experience. And I brought to you here an amazing author who wrote just one of the greatest books I've read about this topic, which is called Couples That Work, Jennifer Petrigelli. Jennifer, are you ready for this ride? I'm ready. Thanks for having me. It is such a pleasure having you here. Did I just destroy your last name? No, it was <laughs> fine. You did almost as well as my children, so we're good. <laughs> Could you say it for us? Petrigelli. So Nomad Nation, as I said, Jennifer has written this book, Couples That Work. I'm going to introduce you to her in just a bit. But I also want to let you know that the purpose of this episode, on top of wanting to invite you to think about your career as an individual in a relationship, but also as an entrepreneur in a relationship while living on the move. And there's a lot that we have to cover here. We'll try to be very succinct and I'm so happy to have Jennifer here to help us from her experience. So Jennifer is an assistant professor at an organizational behavior uh, organization in Seat and the author of Couples at Work, a forthcoming book on dual career couples that can thrive in love and work. Her award-winning research and teaching focus on identity, leadership, and career development. And at INSEAD, she directs the Management Acceleration Program and the Women Leaders Program. She has been shortlisted for the Thinkers 50 New Thinker and Talent Awards and named one of the world's best four business school professors and the 40 by Poets and Quants. What an achievement, Jennifer. That's amazing. And on top of that nomad nation, Jennifer herself knows what it is to have a global nomadic lifestyle. She is British, married to an Italian husband. They met in Switzerland. They moved to Boston. And now they live in France. And they also have children. So they did this. They know what it is to live on the move. So I can't think of a better person than you to have to come here on the show. Thank you for making the time. And I just want to start with one thing. About that I found really interesting about the book that you wrote was that you've wrote it not just based on your experience, but also based on five years of research. So you brought your talent as a researcher and your own experience, plus interviewed couples worldwide from all different ranges of life to be able to come up with a model and suggestion to help people to figure out their own solution. It's not about giving people a roadmap of how to do it, but rather how do you figure out your own solution? Am I right about that? Absolutely. I think people are sick of people telling them, well, this is what I did. You should do the same. You know, that's not helpful to anyone because our lives are unique. And so the research is really to think about what are the patterns across all couples? And from that, what we can, can we learn about the pitfalls, the things we definitely shouldn't do, and the ways we can go about making decisions that are right for our couple. Amazing. And how many couples did you interview along these five years to be able to come up with this book? So well over a hundred. And you know, I'm always collecting stories. So when people ask me that, I'm like, I'm not sure what the current count is. <laughs> but well over a hundred. And um, I interviewed them across time as well. So it wasn't just 
looking at them at one point in time. That's exactly what I found interesting about the book is that not only you come up with your analytic perspective as a researcher, but you brought in so many uh, stories and some of them just gave me goosebumps because we kind of follow the models uh, through your your system through the book by taking the stories, real life stories, and many of them, not just one. So this was really powerful to see how the theory comes into place into real life. Yeah. So that was so good. And okay, so where to start about this topic? This is such, like I said in the introduction, at the foundation of why I started Tandem Nomads, because I had to give up my career to be able to move and find a solution that works for us and also that works for me for my career, works for my husband for his career, but also for us as a couple. Yeah. So my biggest question at the end of the day, I want to talk about actually a I want to make sure that in this episode, we talk about one problem that I see once people, once one of the partners decide to give up a career to start a portable business to live on the move, is that at some point, actually right away, this business is not considered as a priority. It's considered as a side gig. So I want to talk about that a little bit. But in order to do that, I think we need to back up a little bit to explain a little bit the foundation of how to think about this journey, no matter if we're just starting or if we are in the middle of it, of being a dual career couple. So what are the, what is the main thing that you've learned, the main difference for you between the couples that actually work and the couples that don't work figuratively and, (laughs) and practically? Yeah. So there's obviously couples make all sorts of different choices and some choices work really well for some couples and the same choices can be a disaster for other couples. So it's not about what couples do. It's very much about the way they go about doing it, right? So the way they go about making their choices. So for example, do you decide to become a nomadic couple because one of you is earning a lot more than the other? That's a poor decision criteria alone, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not taking into account the other things in life that are important to you. So that's just one example. It's really about the way we go about making the choices as opposed to the choices themselves. And the common feature of couples that worked was that they, um, they very deliberately looked at these decisions and considered a lot a lot a wide range of criteria like what matters most to us what are our ambitions what are our priorities how are we going to support each other and then get to the more practical stuff like how are we going to structure our lives how is this going to work practically but they really started from the bottom up I think a big trap couples make is to go straight into the practicalities oh I've been offered this great role in Shanghai how's it going to work could we get an apartment well those things are important but actually long term they're not important at all you're always going to find an apartment. You're always going to find a school for your kids, whatever it is. This is not going to be the issue. The issue is going to be the power dynamics in the couple, right? The issue is going to be the prioritization. The issue is going to be resentment. It's not going to be the practical aspects of life. You will always eventually muddle through those. Yeah. I love that you talked about the fact that we need to think about the criteria, but also deeper than that, not just the criteria. Because, for example, one of the first one is usually who is making the most money so that we can sustain our lifestyle. And that's the most common thing that happens. The second one is, and you talk about it in the book, is just the society, how it works, and the fact that not only women usually tend to have the pressure to stay at home and, and be the one who are the, the household manager, yeah. While also men who want to give up their career to support their wives for heterosexual couples also have the pressure from this society saying, you're the man, you should be the one who's leading. So there's a lot of societal pressures there. But you, from your research, it seemed like you did see that taking that decision on a financial perspective and on the societal perspective is not necessarily the right way to go. So depends on there's more to consider. So what is it that people should consider to make that decision if it's not those criteria? Yeah, so I think they're one of the criteria, but I think the the difficulty comes when that is the criteria as opposed to a range. The real criteria comes back to the fundamental question, how are you going to measure your life? You know, in 10 years time, you're going to wake up and how do you know you're in the place you want to be? And it's probably not going to be the size of your bank account. 
right? That will be one of the criteria, but it will be, you know, there are certain things that were important to us. Have we had a good shot of achieving them? It's not even about achieving the goals. It's like, did we walk the path we wanted to walk? And that's likely to be professional. It's also likely to have some personal elements. You know, what are the kind of hobbies we wanted to do? What are the communities we wanted to build? What are the support networks we wanted to be part of? There's also an element of the couple, right? What kind of couple did we want to become? Did we want to be the adventure couple that's scooting off and seeing all these new places? Did we want to be a couple who's very social and have a big network? What kind of couple do we want to be? And what I found time and time again was I talked to couples and they'd say, you know, we just woke up one morning and we thought, this is just not where we want to be. And it wasn't about... And it wasn't because they were unsuccessful. They often had good jobs. They were earning good money. That wasn't it. It was just that this was not the yardstick that they were measuring their life against. And I think when people, when we just think of money or just think of the expectation roles, we're missing a lot of things that are important to us. So what is the process then that you recommend to take in order to reflect on what do we want and how to take this journey? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward honestly it's about taking some time to step back and think what are individually and together our priorities in life now by this I don't mean the excel spreadsheet like in two years time I want to do this in five years time I want to do that it's what are the things that are important for me that are almost a piece of my identity that I want to achieve what are they professionally what are they personally what are they as a couple so let me give you a personal example right i really wanted to write a book it was very important to me to do that but to do that required some sacrifice on my husband and kids side right because i also have a full time job so i'm writing that at weekends and in the holidays right so it's if we understand what our partner's priorities are it's much easier for us to make decisions because we know exactly what it is we're trying to support Yeah. Actually there's one thing that I really found interesting in in the book is um there's many things that I found interesting but uh, <laughs> one of them is you talked about three different types of models that exist. Could you tell us more about those so that it can help a little bit? That's the first question and let me just unfold it in case you can wrap it up together. The second thing that I find interesting is the fact that um that we tend to sometimes have that conversation when we start a life together but that conversation has to keep moving and 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 changing on a regular basis so could you also speak of that so the three models and how to evolve across time with those models yeah so there are three kind of basic models of career prioritization the first is the classic model which is primary secondary where one person has the primary career they lead the geographic moves they um they you know their travel takes priority their work takes priority and this, the the secondary person still has a career but it's just sort of less important the second model is turn taking now what that means is essentially you take it in turns to be in the primary position so maybe you have a stint of 3 to 5 years and then you 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 reverse positions and there's another model which is really interesting which is becoming more and more common which is double primary which means that both partners place an equal importance on their careers but they put some boundaries in place now they may be geographic we're not going to leave new york we're going to stay in new york for example or they may be travel wise you know we're going to move around we'll be nomadic but neither of us is going to take a job with more than say 20% travel because we just couldn't manage that And when I looked, you know, one of my questions was which of these models is most successful, right? Mm-hmm. And when I say successful, I mean you feel successful in your job and in your relationship. And when I first looked at the data, I saw that the third model, the double primary was most successful. But um when I looked into it, I really found that of course there were successful couples with the other two models as well. But what was going on was the common feature of all successful couples was they'd really taken the time to deliberately negotiate and explicitly agree what is our deal. Now the problem with the first two models is couples tend to fall into them mm-hmm. more often than not. So just as we were saying before, you know, like for example the primary secondary which is often what tandem nomads are. it can be that someone gets offered that big promotion with that big pay raise oh yeah let's go for it and we've fallen into this model without really talking about 
What does this mean for us both in the long term? How are we going to manage this? And so it's not that the other models can't work. They can, but you need to be more deliberate about those conversations. The thing with the double primaries is so tricky to get right. You're forced into those conversations. So it's not that the model itself is better. It's just that it forces you to have those conversations. And why is that? Right. Just to make sure I understand, why, why is, it, is it that it forces you to, to have that conversation? Because if we're going to have two primary careers, we've got to put some boundaries in place. Mm -hmm. It might be geographic, it might be time, and we've got to talk about those, right, to put them in. So just the mere fact that you're choosing that model forces you to talk about some of that stuff, otherwise it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's easier to fall into the primary, secondary, to fall into the turn taking. And then, you know, you've not quite agreed it, you've just sort of fallen into it. And then that's where the resentment, you know, starts, etc. Yeah. And I also think we tend to discuss these things, as you said, or some of us do anyway, at the start of our relationship, and then we just carry on, we get on the train and we keep walking. And the successful couples are couples who really revisit these. I mean, obviously not every day, not every week, but certainly once a year and certainly at every major transition point. You know, are we both still good with this arrangement? Is it still working for us? Is there anything we need to adjust it? You know, when is the next big point we're going to reassess it? That's really important. Yeah, I think, and one of the, I can see here, for example, in the second model, which is turning, taking turns, where we're adjusting and discussing it, it's even more important because one thing I've noticed from my audience and, and my clients who have started this journey on the move with the principle of tur taking turns. But what has yeah. happened most of the time is that one career takes precedent and at the end, nobody takes, like the model goes back to the first model. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's probably because the conversation is not happening. We just jump on the train and then life goes on and we kind of slide into it. Yeah, yeah. So I can definitely see how the third model is the one that needs the most being proactive about exactly. about planning it if you want it, you know. And that's why it is probably the most successful one. Yeah. Um, you talk about three types of transitions as well, talking about the fact that we are constantly on the move and we need to have regular conversations. So what are these three transitions that you've noticed couples? go through along their life together so the first transition um for most of your lessons probably came when they decided to become tandem nomads right it's the first time we make a big decision together that forces us to make some hard choices and a geographic move is often one of these so before we reach that decision essentially we're living parallel lives so if you think back to the early days of your relationship you know you had your careers going in parallel you had your friends, all the rest of it, and you had this lovely relationship over the top. You know, what's not to like? And then this decision comes, and for the first time, you're faced with the reality that you are dependent on each other, right? One of you cannot make a move without it impacting the other. And this is the first time that major conflicts can arise. And it's also the time when I think we really become a couple, right? We become a couple when we have to make a hard choice that, makes our lives interdependent on each other and this is a transition like each of the transitions which can really make or break couples in two ways it can break them there and then you know we all know couples who faced with that choice have gone their separate ways it can also break couples in that it sets up a dynamic that over time leads to resentment which you you know alluded to earlier right we fall into this pattern and then one day we wake up and say hang on a minute when's my turn so this is where those dynamics get put in motion. It can also be the making of couples, right? If we negotiate that properly in a way that we both enjoy and in a way that suits us both, then we can feel like, oh, we're a couple who support each other and there's this positive reinforcement cycle. So that's the first transition. The second transition is, so that's really in the early stage of our career, of our couple, whether we get together, you know, 28, 48, 68, we're hitting this transition. The second transition is more about career stage. And this tends to come roughly mid-career. And that's a time when many of us take a step back and think, you know, is this really what I want? And it's a question of direction. And it's often quite an existential question. You know, what do I really want with our life, my life? And when there's two of us facing that together, it's pretty stressful mm. time. 
And the choices we make are very consequential because if I shift direction, it has a big impact in your life and vice versa. So this transition is more about reassessment and course adjustment. And, um, and again, it's a time that's very stressful for couples because our decisions by that stage are so interlinked with each other, that it's not simply about making a career move for us because it has such big consequences for the other. And then the final transition comes a little bit later in life when our social roles are changing. So if we think of the early stage of our career, it's this, if we're lucky, it's this career acceleration phase, right? With a bright young thing, we're high potential, we're being moved around, chop, chop, chop. And then at a certain point, naturally, everyone's career starts to plateau. Now, for some of us, it plateaus at a very senior level, for others, a slightly less senior level, but it always plateaus. And very often that sparks these identity questions. Okay, who am I now I'm no longer that bright young star or that the new hotshot in the organization or the new hotshot in the industry. And it's often a time of legacy, right? I've had this great career. I've still got a way left to go. I mean, I'm not retiring at 50 anymore. Most of us are gonna work into our seventies. What do I wanna do now I have this wealth of experience? How do I wanna give back? And how do I wanna structure this latter part of my career? Again, big transition point for couples reorienting for those couples who've had children it's often a point where their children are leaving home so they're free again in some ways um, their bank account is not but they are right their time is free there there's a point where we can really experiment with very different ways of living yeah i want to zoom in into um into the transition i think it's the second one where we start having this identity crisis it is the second one right am i following mm -hmm. well the identity crisis because i can see this is something that has actually been the reason of starting tenant nomads a lot of expat partners who have been starting to work with start thinking about what can i do because they're going through an identity crisis yeah and um but i never thought of the identity crisis of the partner who's working who has taken the whole family on this journey and then says holy moly did i just do a big mistake because i'm actually not happy and now i have to go with it because my partner gave up her his career and now exactly. we just have to go with it yeah exactly and i think we often overlook it's very easy for us to look at the trailing spouse and think oh poor them but actually it's very stressful for the person who led the move as well because the guilt is on their shoulders, right? I forced this, I better get it right. I better be happy. I better get the next promotion. I better get some reward from this because the rest of the family are relying on me. And that puts an enormous pressure on one person's shoulders. And I think that pressure partly comes from the fact that couples haven't set the move up right that the move has been sold as advantaging this person and this person will suck it up. Mm. That's never a good position to start a move for either partner because one has the weight of expectations on their shoulders and the other starts off from the resentful position. I mean, this is a hiding to nothing. And so I think we need to think about both partners and not just think about the person who followed. Yeah, that's a good point actually, because we tend to think about the yeah the the following partner as okay that is the poor person in that situation because this person has sacrificed everything which i do think it has to be acknowledged and a lot of the resentment yeah, of comes from the lack of acknowledgement that i see a lot happening first of all by society by the partner but also by the company who's moving families around and not acknowledging yeah. the role of the partners in the success yeah. of the company right um but i think it is a good point that you're making that we need to also consider the the working partner who has sent the part the, the yeah. family abroad which leads me to actually one thing that i loved about um one of the things you mentioned in this book is the zero-sum approach versus the sum approach no this is the sum approach yeah could you say that could you explain that again like there's two approaches the zero-sum yeah and... so this is really about the mindset we approach a relationship the zero-sum approach is essentially approaching a relationship from a trade-off negotiation stance, right? I give this, you give me that. So there's a pie and we're going to cut it up. The problem is uh, the bigger slice I get, the smaller slice you get. So that just sets up resentment and conflict, right? Because 
our partners should not be a negotiating partner. <laughs> That's not a good basis for a relationship. And yet a lot of our relationships are set up like this. You know, I trade you this for this. Even if we don't quite use that language, psychologically, our mindset is, is looking down that alley. The alternative is a positive sum approach, which is like, okay, let's look at the situation and the opportunity. And what is the best opportunity that we can make work for both of us? Now that may still be the move abroad, but it's how do we set that up in a way that it benefits both partners, of course, in different ways. And then what we find is the move is seen as a positive by both partners, as opposed to a sacrifice and a, and a guilt situation. And it's a very different mindset. Now, this is not about partners getting equal benefits, right? That's impossible. But it's about both partners having a skin in the game. And when you've got a skin in the game, you're more likely to work hard to make it work. You're less likely to be resentful and you're more likely to work as a team as opposed to, oh my God, you dragged me here and this doesn't work and I wasn't expecting this. I mean, this is not good for couples. Yeah. So you do recommend definitely the positive sum approach instead of the trade-off yeah. approach, which is the zero sum yeah. approach. And I just want to quote you here. I, the sentence for me was an aha moment when you said, um, the, the this positive sum approach is the opportunity to undo the paralyzing roles instead of reversing it. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to explain that? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes the way we, um, the way we compensate for someone having one quote unquote <laughs> is to say, okay, next time it's your turn. And all we're doing then is flipping the seesaw, right? So rather than you winning and me losing, now I win and you lose. But there's still a winner and a loser, mm -hmm. which is not helpful. What we need to do is both move towards the middle of the seesaw, right? So we can achieve some balance. And so that in each decision we make, we both win a bit and we probably both lose a bit as well. But that's okay as long as we're both in balance. So what is it to have, what is it to have a... Um, how can you do it instead of polarizing? Because I can see that we should really make sure that we don't have that lose-win situation. But what should, we, what should we do instead? It really comes back to the decision-making criteria, right? So before we get to a decision, we've negotiated the decision-making criteria and said, what, what is the minimum bar for both of us, right? What is a move that would be positive for you and positive for me? Okay, and if um, the move does not live up to that those criteria, it's a no, right? And also acknowledge that any move, we're both going to lose a bit as well. You know, there's no perfect move. Now, it might not be just losing professionally, it might be losing personally. Maybe you've made an amazing network. You know, maybe your husband's made an amazing network of colleagues and he has to leave them. Or maybe he's got in with, I don't know, a sports club he absolutely adores. And it's going to be a big loss for him, right? So it's not just about professional, but it's about balancing up those, you know, the positive sides and loss, loss sides to make sure that it's roughly even. Yeah. And do you have any resources that, you can recommend to help people make these decisions how to actually list the criteria evaluate them yeah so two things so i mean in the book there are some exercises you can go through with your partner to kind of have these deliberate conversations also if people go to my website which maybe you can put in the show notes yeah, definitely um, they can find a lot of worksheets to download to go through some exercises as well Wonderful. So Nomad Nation, to find all those worksheets and all the information, please go to tandemnomads.com slash 168, and I will put all that information there. Um, I, I want to talk now about this specific issue that I've noticed when I work with my clients. As much as the relationship, the partners want to support each other and are supportive to each other, sometimes we don't necessarily know exactly how to support each other. That's the first. The yeah. second is that I've noticed a lot of the times because the following partner has given the career and then after the second transition, they start a business. They're ready to start rebuilding their business because the kids are big enough. Now it's yeah. time for me to take care of myself. I'm going to start my business. But that business is still considered as a hobby 
Therefore, they can't succeed at their business because they cannot have the support system they need to be able to dedicate the energy, the focus that they need to succeed at it. So do you have any tips that you can share for that? How can we make the business become as important as the partner's job who's making the money versus the business probably costing money? Yeah. So I think this comes down to, and it's interesting you said about the support piece. So in my research, I found that couples rarely failed because they didn't support each other. They failed because they didn't know what it was they were supporting. Mm. And I think a lot of this is taking the responsibility to make our partners understand why we are doing this and why it's important to us. Right? Because the natural way of thinking about it is, well, I earn a lot of money, you know, you're a bit bored, this is a nice way to occupy your time. Now, if you don't educate me otherwise, that's a kind of natural assumption. And that leads me to treat your business in a certain way. As opposed to if there's a conversation around, I really want to kickstart my career. And I see, you know, I know I'm not going to earn much money for the first few years. But this is a really important piece of my professional identity to make a go of this then my mindset is geared in a very different way to treat and think about your business. So I think sometimes we don't get because we don't ask, you know, yes. we assume our partner understands how important it is to us. Like, why don't, why don't they get it? Well, if you don't tell them, they can't get it. Oh, right? amen to that. Amen to that. I keep always saying that to all my friends and my clients, don't expect your partner to guess what you need Tell them what you need. <laughs> you need to tell them what you need and, uh, and help them understand how important this is to you. And the reality is that most partners out there want to be supportive and they want to help and they want you to feel like you have a good professional identity. And if they understand, first of all, why you're doing this, Next, what your, go well, what your goal is, right? What you're trying to achieve. And then third, if there's some specific things they can be doing, mm. I bet you will get them. Yeah, exactly. The specific. Is, the issue is we're not specific. We don't say we assume they know. And it turns both ways. Oftentimes when we're in that secondary position, we can feel that simply by being in that position, we're being supportive. You know, I gave up my career. I'm the supportive one but our partners may not necessarily feel that support mm. because the support they're looking for is quite different. So it's a two way street. I think if you're asking your partner what support they need and giving it, they're much more likely to do the same to you. So I think it's about rethinking our role as supporters and also educating our partner about the kind of support we need. I love that you bring this up. There's so many things to unpack, but I think you made a very good point about number one, making sure that the partner knows why it's important for you. Then be specific of what you actually need them to do. And third, yeah. not forget that it's not because you gave up your career that you should be considered like you've done your job of being supportive because there might be other issues that the working partner is dealing with that you might not even be aware of. And balancing the relationship is about coming back in the same level, but on both sides, like you said, two, two way street. I love that. I need to address the elephant in the room here. I think if everybody does that, we're already well off, pretty well off. But in some cases, I know that doesn't always work like that. Like even if we do express the importance, we still don't feel like we have the support we need. So what to do in that case? So, I mean, I think there's two things, there's two things to do. And obviously these are unique situations, so it's hard to generalize. But I think one, and you know, it's an interesting time we're living at at the, at the moment with the pandemic, yep. Yep. is to realize that even the most gold shiny um, expat job is not safe, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of redundancies, there's a lot of layoff. And I think in a, in a couple, even if we look secure, we are not. And to be very open about the need to hedge, right? Hedge financially. What if you are laid off tomorrow, right? My business is a financial backup. I may not be earning a lot now, but it's something we've got in backup. And this sounds very hard-nosed and rational. But for those people who are usually not very supportive, this kind of argument very often works, right? Is, you know, what if you're laid off tomorrow? Then what, 
right? At least we'll have a bit of income coming in from me. And so you better support me as the backup plan. And I think, you know, it's maybe not the way we would like to get support, but I actually think it's a decent argument these days. And certainly in the next few months and year, many of your listeners may be thrown into that position, which is not a great place to be, but it's the reality of the world we're living in right now. Oh my God, you're talking, my, my face is hurting from smiling and my neck from nodding because you mentioned this, we're recording this episode during the pandemic and and hopefully when it will be out, we'll hopefully have a better visibility on where we're going with this. But in the past two weeks, I've spoken with four to five of my clients and friends who suddenly their partner's jobs were threatened and suddenly yeah. the partner could see how, oh, wow, your business is more needed than ever. I never, can, I never realized that your business was actually a source of security for us now, yeah. that my job is not a secure place that amazing and just being aware of that and having that conversation that my business can be a backup plan for us as a family not yeah. just an identity crisis uh bandage for me to deal Absolutely. with it yeah. and i think that mindset also will help you nomad nation if you're listening well and starting a business for you to be successful at your business to have the sense of urgency that your business is not just for you a place to express yourself but as well a backup plan for your family then you'll feel that motivation and and to fight for you to be able to do the work that you find yeah. that you don't have the time to do and you know the interesting thing i mean i found in my research that many of these businesses which were started as a bit of a side hustle a bit of a kind of occupying time, I want to get back into the professional work, workplace. When people were serious about them, they grew and they overtook what was the primary job, right? Mm -hmm. And they enabled the couple to switch positions, to have better choices, to make very different decisions, which was not really even the intention at the beginning. Um, and so I think, you know, things change very quickly. Businesses grow, organizations fail people become redundant. You cannot predict the future based on the present. Amazing. This is such great insights. There's so much more we could talk about. We have to wrap this interview. I just want to ask you a last question. Sometimes we learn from mistakes. So what are the biggest mistakes you've seen people do and you recommend to not do? So I think the biggest mistake is to develop a difference of power in your relationship. And by power, I mean are you supported to go for what you want? And when one person feels supported and the other person doesn't, this is where the resentment comes from. So even if your jobs aren't paying the same, even if they're very different status, if you're both supported to push forward and feel empowered, you will do okay in your relationship. If not, you're going to hit the rocks. That's amazing. Wow. Is there anything else you want to share before we say goodbye? No, I'm good. We covered so many things here, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Could you tell us where's the best way to find you? So the best way to find me is on my website, which I'll put on the show notes, or in any good bookstore, you can buy Couples That Work, the book. Yes. I highly recommend it, Nomad Nation. I was telling to Jennifer when we started, I wish I had this book when I started my journey. I would have understood so much what the journey I was on. So I'm, I'm grateful that everything went well for me. But I'm, what I loved about this book is that it's not only for those who are just starting, but even if you're in the midst of it, it's, it can be super helpful, as well as knowing that, uh, in French we say, la vie n'est pas un long fleuve tranquille. I don't, know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to translate that one. Any idea? Like life is not a, a gentle river. <laughs> exactly. And, and there will the waterfall be, is coming up. <laughs> exactly. The waterfall can come up. doesn't have to, but yeah. it's good to know and, and visualize what are the transitions we're going through so that we can assess it together in a better way so that we can actually work in terms of career, business, but as well as a couple. And I loved what you said is how can we make couples thrive in love and work. So this was amazing. Thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you. Nomad Nation, I hope you found some great inspiration here. To find all the information, go to tandemnomads.com slash 168. I look forward to hearing from you, share your feedback in the show notes of this episode, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Stay tuned to turn your challenges into great opportunities.